Children's dismissed for the children's church. I was reading a story this week and it really touched my heart. And it's about the Lord, how He values us and how those around us do not value. And the story went that a father was on his deathbed and he gave his son his father's watch. And he says, son, I want you to go down to the local jeweler and see how much he'll give you for it. And his son leaves, goes to the jeweler, and the jeweler looks at the watch, inspects it, and says, it's an antique. It needs some cleaning. Runs fairly well. We'll give you $150. He said, okay, thank you. Goes back to his father and he says, Dad, they'll give me $150 for it because it's old, antique, and needs some cleaning. His dad says, go to the pawn shop and see what they'll give you for it. He goes to the pawn shop. The guy looks it over and he goes, they'll give you 10 bucks because it's old, not really worth much, needs a lot of cleaning. And he said, it just... It's just old. So he comes back and he said, Dad, they said this. And they'll give us 10 bucks for it. He says, Son, no. I want you to go to the museum and see what they'll give it for. He goes to the museum and the curator puts it under the microscope, looks at it closely, and he begins to light up and become really giddy. He goes, I'll give you half a million dollars for it. This is one of three that were made. And this is our very rare watch. And we want to exhibit it in our artifacts. And the moral of the story was, not everyone will value you like the Lord values you. The world values us as Christians as a $10 timepiece. Or a $150 antique. But the Lord values us as something priceless and rare. Because be honest, we are one of a kind. Because <laughs> after he made me, he broke the mold. Aren't you glad? <laughs> you know, we are one of a kind. You are who you are. We have a world that wants to change who we are. And so that we're all the same people, think the same, act the same, and we accept the same. How boring. And we might as well be in the Orson Welles AI books. <laughs> we're all artificial intelligence. They all do what we're told to do by the programmer. I'm glad God, when he programmed us all, he programmed with all different personalities, all different looks, all different temperaments, all different characteristics. That's what makes the world priceless, is we're not just one person. We're billions of different people. Each priceless in the maker's eyes. And when we want to go and change our environment, change who we are, change what God wants for us, it defeats the purpose of God creating mankind. If he wanted robots, he would have created robots. But he created Adam and Eve for fellowship. He walked in the garden with them. He talked with them. The disciples walked with him. You know the greatest verse that says they were with him. What better to be a witness with Christ. 
He walked alongside them. Our God did not create us just to be yes men and yes women and yes kids. He created us to be fellow laborers. He created us to be fellowshippers. To walk with Him. As I was studying the last couple weeks, I saw this title and I thought about many things. Growing despite our environment. Whatever you're in, God has you there to grow. Even in the harsh of environments, how are we going to grow? I think about this a lot. I myself can give up very easily. It's just how it was. Over time, I've been able to build on that weakness. And this is something that I've learned over hardships God has put me in. And to the point where now, this has given me the resolve. This has been the longest and hardest I've been in one place. And this has been the hardest environment I've been in. But I refuse to quit until God tells me to. There are many jobs I've been in. I hated them. I was absolutely miserable. And over time, God allowed me to build a tough skin. Go from a leatherback turtle to a hardback. Amen. Take a little bit harder. Take a little bit more punches on the chin. Take, keep going. And as you see this, as we get older, we get that resolve. People say it's grumpiness, but it's, it's a resolve like, I've already moved enough as a young kid and a young man and a young adult and a senior, but now I'm just tired of moving and this is me, who you like it or not. You know, we, we can just put the banner on the door. This is where the old grumpy old man lives. You know, we, we can live that way. We've made up our mind. We're not moving anymore. If someone doesn't like us, that's just tough beans. That's the way we're not being rude. It's where we know that we have resolve. Our world is nothing more than a jellyfish. They have no spine. They just go wherever the waves take them. I don't want to be a jellyfish anymore. I've been a jellyfish. And I have found out one thing in life. Pleasing other people never turns out well. If you conform so much to make other people happy, they're still not happy. And I realized over time, I'm tired of making people happy. I want to make God happy. I want to make my Savior who created me happy in who He created. And as I look at this, in Ezekiel chapter 3, turn with me there, Ezekiel chapter 3, Solomon's writing. This is his last book before he passes away. And he writes some great thought. And we all know Ezekiel chapter 3 is used in funerals a lot. And no, you're not dying yet. To everything, he says, there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven. And I want to read that verse, and I'm going to drop down to verses 10 through 12. I mean, verses 11 through 15. But he starts off, he says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. There is a time for everything and everywhere we go. And the Bible says here in verse 11, He hath made everything beautiful in His time. Now notice, I want you to see something that I've already seen. It's His time. It's His time, not mine. To everything, there is a season. He hath made everything beautiful in His time. Also, He hath set the world in their heart. So that no man can find out the work that the Lord maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men shall fear before him. That which hath been now, been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this portion of scripture. As we look at what you said, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. 
Lord, thank you for making this world. Thank you for making each individual here and online this morning. Use this, I pray, to challenge us to grow despite our environment. And Lord, help us in all that we say and do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We sometimes forget God orchestrates things. And what we have today is already done in His eyes. That, that's something when you look at it, everything that is done has been done in God's eyes for years. Centuries, millenniums. That's hard to wrap our mind around that God already knows how it's going to end. God, our, God knew how it began. God knows what's going on now. But God is patiently waiting for us just to calm down and let Him be in control. And notice it says everything is beautiful in His time. Also, He has set the world in their heart so that no man could find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. We want to know, what's tomorrow going to hold? You know what he tells us in Matthew? Don't worry about tomorrow. You know what he says in James? Our life is as a vapor. Don't make too many plans for tomorrow that you may not keep. The Lord will. I'm going to see you guys on Tuesday night. Lord willing. It'd be pretty emphatic to say, I'll see you on Tuesday night. It may not be Tuesday night. One of those trees may doink me on the head while I'm cutting them down. You know, who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I could die of a heart attack. I could die in a car wreck. I don't know what God has. I could have a stroke. I could have an aneurysm. I could have, oh, but pastor, you're only 50. Yeah, but I'm still a mortal creature. God can do anything. If my time is to come, my time is to come. This is the thing. We make like we are going to live forever or we want when we can't figure out why we're in this storm. What's happening? What's the purpose? What, what are you trying to do? Sit back, relax, and say, God, you put me here for a reason. Help me to understand your time in your time. God has a time, but sometimes we want to figure out how A to Z goes really quick. <laughs> we're like, okay, God, I got A down. Let me have Z now. But we forget the rest of the alphabet. God has a point. He doesn't skip to A to Z sometimes. He goes A, B, C, D. I was like, hey, Lord, we have enough alphabet counting. Let's get to the finish line and be done with it. God says, wait a minute. I'm not done with you. Can you imagine Job? What about Daniel? Daniel serves God all his life, and he gets thrown in the lion's den at 80 years old. Okay, Lord. <laughs> Why now? <laughs> You know, I'm nothing but skin and bones now. I could have been a little bit more back then when I was young. Who knows? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why, Lord? Because he wanted to prove himself that he was going to be the fourth man in the fire. This is the thing. We don't know. Paul, God, I'm serving you. Why do I keep getting beat? Why do I keep running out of cities? Why do I keep going to get jail? Why am I stoned? Paul says, whatever state I am, therewith I've learned to be content. That's hard to do. You look at all the things. So this morning, I'm going to look at four things, and I've put pictures on there to really give you an idea of the tenacity of a tree. God has made you a tree. Are you going to grow wherever you're at. First of all, I want you to see, are you walled out? Notice this tree. It's growing on an old castle. Of all things, really? What's there to grow? But look at the root system. It may be walled out, but it's still growing. And it's growing into where the green, it's not brown, it's alive. It's getting nutrients from something. That wall is not stopping it. It's going over. You know what? A bird dropped a seed somewhere, fell in a crack, found a little bit of soil, and that's a tree. And I saw that. Are we walled out? Sometimes we feel like there is a wall in front of us and we cannot go over it, go under it, go around it, or go through it. And you know what we tend to do? All right, there's a wall. We're leaving. Aren't you glad 
when the wall of the Red Sea was standing before Moses, he didn't go, okay, we're going home. But you know what the children of Israel did? Oh, you brought us here to die. <laughs> Wait a minute. They just went 40 miles and already they're ready to give up. <laughs> wow. They were crying because they were being beat, crying because they were being starved, crying because they had to do extra work, crying because their kids were being killed, and they make it 40 miles, and not only did that, God provided for them, God gave them the wealth. He spoiled Egypt, and they made it 40 miles, and they want to give up. Guess what's behind them? The pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. Guess what's in front of them? A massive sea. Guess what's on the other side of them? Mountains. Guess what's on the other side of that fire? The entire Egyptian army. But you know what they saw? We're going to die. Guilty. <laughs> We've all been against the wall and thought, like, Lord, okay, you brought me here to fail. That's just lovely. As my dad would say, that's just ducky. But Exodus 14, turn with me there. Exodus 14. I want you to see how big their God is. Exodus 14. And in verse 10, the Bible says that when Pharaoh drew nigh, and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and beheld the Egyptians marching after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. What an attitude. An attitude like that, they should give up. It's better for us to die under the slave's master's whip. It's better for us to our adult son or child, children, boys, baby boys to be killed. They were ready to give up. But let me ask you a question. Would you rather die as a bondman or free man? I personally would rather die as a free man. Bury me where you may. But they were saying we'd rather die slaves. We would rather die under the Egyptians than die in the wilderness as an Israelite and free. Did you just bring us here to get slaughtered? Thank you very much. Appreciate that kind gesture, but thanks, but no thanks. But aren't you glad it didn't stop there? Verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. God did a miracle. I don't know about you, but that was not plexiglass holding the water up on each side to make it look pretty like you're on the aquarium going, oh, kids, look at this. Don't worry. That glass is three foot thick. It won't come through. No, it was just God's hand. And as they walked, has anybody ever walked in an old pond or lake and you step in the muck and the mire at the bottom and you go down about two feet? Been there, done that. And it's like, and, you know, that wasn't the case. That part of the Red Sea had never seen dry. It was under the sea. And yet God dried it until the entire Egyptian army got on them. And he mired their wheels, the horses, the people's feet. You know what the Bible says? And as the people moved on, the water came behind them. That's another miracle. I was reading that this week. I was like, I never noticed that. I thought they got all the way through. But as they were walking, the last person, the water was coming in and keeping them dry. 
God was work, and what greater miracle is to walk behind you, be that last person. Come on, Johnny, hurry up, <laughs> speed up a little bit. He, I can see the boys running the fingers in the water, you know, on the side, doing all these things little boys and girls would do, and like, ooh, mom, look fish. But as they're walking on, all of a sudden the wall comes directly behind them, and the Egyptians are gone. The Bible says not a one survived. Pharaoh and the entire army of that time was decimated. You know what's interesting? Archaeologists are still finding gold scepters, spears, chariot wheels, brass axles all at the bottom of the Red Sea. Hmm. Imagine how they got there. God did a miracle. When they were walled out, they were un surpassable on any direction. They go back, they're going to be killed. Pharaoh was mad. He wasn't just going to take him back, he's going to kill him. Why? His son and every male son, no matter the age, died. If God's angel did not see the blood on the doorpost. They were not real happy. Plus, the Israelites spoiled them. They were bankrupt. And yet, where are they going to go? Over the mountains? No. Go drown in the sea? They had nowhere to go until God opened the door. When we're walled out and we can't go forward, we can't go backwards, I want us to go up. Go to God. And the Lord caused the sea to go back. This tree went up. We sometimes, we look around, we look to the side, we look there, just like Peter walking on water, looked at the circumstances, looked at the water, looked at everything else, but he didn't look at Jesus. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on water. As long as we keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do great things through Christ who strengthens us. Not for our glory, but for His. Sometimes in life, you may be there now, you may feel boxed in, walled out. Look up. Keep looking up. God has not changed. Second of all, I want you to see something else. Locked up. Sometimes, I love this picture. There's a little plant growing out of the keyhole. Sometimes we feel like we're locked up. We just, no matter what, we can't move. We literally feel powerless. That our potential is locked up. Our life is locked up. Nothing seems, it feels like we're just in prison. Everywhere we look, there's not a wall. There's just keys. There's just locks. Can't go that door. Can't go there. Can't go there. What do we do? I want us to turn to Acts chapter 16. Paul is a perfect example. Acts chapter 16 and verse 20. Sometimes in life we look for ways out of the prison we're in instead of rejoicing in the prison. We look for God, get us out. Give me the key so I can get out of here. I've learned my lesson, do whatever. Maybe God's not ready for us to get out. Maybe God has us in locked up for a reason. Maybe we got to find the praise in the prison. Maybe we got to find praise. Maybe there's a reason. You know what I found out? There's safety being locked in. There, it's nice to be secure. I was reading a conversion story of a convert, convict who became a convert of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he said? When I got out, I felt more overwhelmed than I was when I was in. And he surrendered his life to be a chaplain. And you know what he asked? In a little state prison in Mississippi, he asked the warden to build him a room in the prison. 
He said, this is home. I've served my time and I served it with these men and I want to continue serving these men from my home. So he built, took an old cell and he built him a room and he died at the age of 89, never getting married, but he served 34 years as a chaplain of the state prison in prison. And he said, you know, I always wanted to get out and then I got out and I was to them a convict. To them, I never outrun my crime. But in prison, God freed me. And I wanted to share with the convicts that God, even though we can be in prison, can be free. And he says, that was my security. Every night at 8 p.m., I heard the guards holler out, lock up, and all the doors, Lights out, 10 o'clock. I had a routine. Breakfast, 8 o'clock. Lunch, 12 o'clock. Dinner, 5 o'clock. P.E. time. Everything was a ritual. I felt secure. It was a place. And then I found the Lord. And I relished the time when it was free time. And I got in God's word. And I just studied and grew. I didn't look at the prison bars as a place of holding me. I looked at a place of keeping me where God wanted me. You know, sometimes we're like, I want out of this. I cannot wait to be free. I cannot wait to get out of this trial. I cannot wait here and there and everywhere. But maybe that's where God wants you to be. Until we accept that God has me in this prison for a reason. Not to keep me but to grow me. Sometimes it's hard to be locked up and not do what we want to do. But maybe that's for our own benefit. God wants us to do what he wants to do. Can you imagine going back and saying, Warden, I'm your new chaplain. And I want to live in the prison. I want to eat the prison food. I want to minister and they said, only heaven will know the countless converts. This crippled black fellow that gave his life to Jesus Christ will ever have. His first name, no one really knew much of his last name because at the 50s, didn't really matter. But his name was Zedekiah. This chaplain gave his life to the Lord after he gave his life to the Lord as a 30 year old man the thing was he looked at the prison as a place of holding him and then he looked at a place of keeping him we look at things it's a perspective here's Paul in chapter 16 and verse 20 to 25 and brought them to the magistrate saying these men being Jews do extremely troubling trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. As I mentioned in Bible study on Wednesday night, the Roman stocks were not made for comfort. They were made to spread the legs of a man so far apart it was excruciating to sit. You think about this. These two men were just beaten with many stripes, cat of nine tails. And the Romans beat one from the front and one from the back. So there was not a part of them not marred and ripped open. They were doing what God wanted them to do. They were now sitting in these stocks uncomfortable. And also I mentioned they would, the stocks were so tight it would more or less most of the time break the ankles of the person sitting there. The Romans were not in it for comfort. They were, you were a prisoner and you're going to be treated as such. And they sang praises. 
where the entire prison heard them singing, Our Great Savior, to God be the glory. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. How do we do? Your rump would be ripped apart with a cat of nine tails. Your back, your front, your legs, your arms would be ripped with a cat of nine tails. Your ankles would probably be broken or close to it, and you're stretched far than a ballerina could ever stretch. And you're singing praises. To where the prisoners, they didn't look the prison as a place of holding them. They looked at a place of praise. And at midnight, God heard their praise and rent that prison in two. But here's the miracle. Not one prisoner escaped. The jailer came in, and like all Romans, if you lost one prisoner under your care, you were to be publicly executed as with your family. As a sign of, don't do that again. So he was going to take his life and be done with it. They would have spared his family. But Paul says, hey, sir, don't. Not one person has escaped. What's the first thing to do if the prison doors opened in most prisons? You'd have prisoners everywhere. The RCMP would be busy. The Durham Regional Police would be busy trying to round them up, but not here. They stayed. That's a miracle. God gave them a piece of being in prison. You think about that. When you're locked up, when you're locked out, are you looking to get out or stay where God has you? Are you ready to get this trial over and get on with life? It was an inconvenience. It was a bother for us. Or you look at this prison at Zedekiah. What do I have to go out to there? This is my home. This is my ministry. Warden, can you build me a 12 by 12 room? That's all I need. 12 by 12. He said, all I have to my possession is what the prison gave me. He was in it for murder. He served a life sentence before he was paroled. And he comes back, he says, no, I'm done. I want to come back. The only difference between him and the other prisoner is on his prison jumpsuit, he did not have a number. He had chaplain. Think about this. He was happy where God had saved him and put him to work. 12 by 12 room and no possessions of whatever he had. You look at this and we see Oh, that's a brave man. But God can do the same, give us that same peace and same thing where Paul says, whatever state I am therewith, I've learned to be content. Whether it was in prison in stocks, whether it was being stoned, whether it was being shipwrecked, he had learned no matter if he was locked out, he was locked up where God wanted him to be. Daniel. He was locked out too. But he still used his whole ordeal. Growing despite our environment. You know what he says? Cyrus or Darius, O king, live forever. My God, touch these lions' mouth. He made such an impression on that heathen king that the king declared that no one's going to worship anybody but Daniel's God. But he did not know at all. God didn't whisper to him and say, hey, Daniel, don't worry about it. I know you're 80. All's good. We're gonna throw, they're they're going to throw you in the lion's den, and I'm going to show. No, he did not have a prerequisition uh, of a list of going, it's going to be, just play the part. We're just going to play it all out. What part of faith is that? The just shall live by faith. It doesn't say we're going to know the answer at the end of the story. But are we going to live by faith? Daniel did. Can you imagine? Daniel's a man. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. Just as Paul was. Just as Stephen was. Every one of us is going to have a measure of fear. As you hear some hungry lions and knowing they're rolling this stone back for you to be thrown in there. You and me. All right. Let me. No, you don't need to throw me. I'm going to jump right in. Are you kidding? <laughs> 
I'll be like, oh, wait a minute, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really hungry after all. Oh, no, oh, I'm the meal. Okay, I'm sorry. But what about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Did they fight being tied up? You think about all of these situations, how would we do? It's God's grace. They were there for such a time as this. Daniel, Paul, because of their willingness to be locked out and locked up for the Lord, they were able to impact far greater than they can imagine. Maybe sometimes, even if we're locked up and all the doors are closed, bloom where God's planted you. It may take a while. I wonder what that lock will look like in about 10 years. I mean, I love old stuff like that. People just walk by it and I'm like, hmm, that's intriguing. Plants, weeds will grow anywhere. Let's be a weed. We got weeds coming through the parking lot. Weeds are going through asphalt. They're tenacious. Maybe we ought to be a dandelion. Amen? No matter how much you try to kill them, they still come back every year. Let's be that, let's be that dandelion for Christ. Amen? Let's bloom where God's planted us. But what about after being walled out, maybe locked up and locked out? Sometimes we feel isolated, don't we? You know, there's no other tree around on this little cliff, but it's still growing. I can't help but think of Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 17. Here is a man that lived a solitude life. Did what God had him to do. And he even asked the Lord to go ahead and take his life because there was no other serving the Lord. That gave you an idea that he wasn't in contact with other Christians. He wasn't in contact with other prophets, other believers. He was it. But God had him for a purpose. And look in verse 1. And Elisha the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be not a dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came into him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook of Cherub, and that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, I, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according in the word of the Lord, and he went and dwelt by the brook of Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had no, been no rain in the land. Here we have a story of a prophet who God himself said, Go tell Ahab what's going to happen, the prophecy. And then go to a brook, and I'm going to feed you day and night. Now, ravens are like crows, just bigger. I don't really care to have what they're bringing from their mouth. They're, they're scavengers. They'll eat anything. But I have a personal theological opinion that they probably snapped from Ahab's food table. It would be just like God to command them just to kind of go in. Because, you know, palaces were open. And just fly by the T-bone steak and grab it off there and give it to old uh, Elijah. I don't know. But I don't think God would have fed his choice servant with roadkill. I think God took care of his servant with the very best. But he was isolated. He was all alone. I know that is probably the most difficult thing of any believer is to feel alone. To feel like you're standing alone. As he said, I'm standing alone, Lord. What about God's place in life? We have widows and widowers in our church. We have single people in our church. We have people in working environments that they're the only Christian. We feel isolated. We feel alone. But folks, we're never alone. We have God. And as we look around, and sometimes we do get the Elijah. I get the Elijah syndrome. 
I look at pastor friends that I've known, pastor acquaintances that I've known, dipping their flags, leaving the ministry, removing their standards, removing their just plain taking their churches in a different direction. And I think, wow, is there anybody standing for the Lord anymore? I look around and I see people just saying, coming, doing, being a whatever to whoever church. Espousing whatever just so they can get a crowd. And you wonder, is there any more people willing to stand for something instead of fall for everything? Where are the people with the backbones? Where are the moral people of our country? Where are the people that are willing to say, enough is enough. We've been in a circus long enough. We need to stand for our beliefs. And people are like, well, I, you know, I might offend someone. I, I read something that just shocked me. And I, I, I about giggled. And I'm not promoting this program at all, but Netflix CEO told everybody, he says, tough beans. If you don't like it, you can go. We're not going to censor our programs anymore. Because they're going to be, they were wanting to, all the left was wanting to censor anything that people have spoke out against anything. He says, after $54 billion loss, they says, listen, we're going to equally give the left and the right airtime. And left, if you don't like the right's airtime, there's the door. And I'm like, bravo, somebody has a backbone. If you don't like something, we live in a country where we're supposed to have the freedom of speech. But so far, anything that anybody says on the right, it's censored by the left, but that's okay. But if the right ever censors the left, oh, wow, that's hate crimes, that's everything else. We get labeled. So Netflix, after a $54 billion, you know, Christians, that says something. When the moral right stands up and says, listen, you're going to censor our programs, and it really wasn't worth censoring, we're just going to cut it off. Cut the paycheck, and guess what happens? People start $54 billion later going, oh, we're going to be a double take. But aren't you glad when someone says, if you don't like what's going on, there's the door. We need a backbone, Christians, when people say, well, we don't like your faith. Well, I don't like how you speak. But I'm not asking you to leave. I don't, act, I don't like how you live. But I'm not asking how you leave. We need to turn about and nicely say, hey, this is me. As the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, we're beautifully made. My God made me who I am. If you don't like it, don't work around me. Don't live around me. You know, we need to live our life according to God's plan. We need to not feel like Elijah goes, well, there's no one else serving the Lord. Yes, there are. There are good Christians all around the world that are willing and dying for their faith. There is faithful people all around. We're not alone. This is not the only church in Canada that's serving the Lord. There are many. But sometimes the devil wants to get on our shoulders and say we're isolated. No, we're not. I am never isolated serving the Lord. Because I've got a great church family. We look at things and we see because when God changed his environment, God changed his location because the very next verse, he finds the widow woman and she is about to fix her last meal. And guess what? God says, I'm going to take care of you too if you take care of the man of God. And he did. And God took care of Elijah once again. When our circumstances changed, guess what? He's still alone. But God changed his perspective. And this is where Job, he too felt isolated. His wife turned on him. His children are gone. His three friends were not friends at all. But in chapter 42, for the sake of time, he basically repents of his attitude of woe is me. He never cursed God, but he was discouraged. And God showed himself real. And he says, Lord, I am but dirt, dust and ashes. Forgive me. You know what the Lord did? He blessed him double. Sometimes we need to say, Lord, I am what I am. And I'm sorry that I have a poor as me attitude. I just want to serve you. You made me who I am. We need to be that Zedekiah where, Lord, 
I want to get right back where you had me in the first place. That's the happiest I'm going to be. It's not out there trying to be what I want to be, but be in here where you want me to be. Isolated, we can still be a majestic tree like this. Just imagine, that's solid rock, and yet it's still growing. The power of growth. No obstacle can hinder the growth of that tree. It's beautiful. Man, what, what a photographer. And I couldn't fit the whole picture on her. That is a very high precipice. And it's standing alone. But you know what they said? That place in Africa is the most photographed cliff there was. Why? It's unique. <laughs> I don't, there's a place where, it's hard, as you can see the mountains behind them, there's hardly any trees. And that's one tree up there. And you know what's the question is on everybody? How did it get up there? A bird, of course, but you know. <laughs> but how did it get up? It's growing. It doesn't matter how it got up there. It matters that it's growing and it's living. And everybody is appealed. Everybody's drawn. That's the way we ought to be. We may be alone, but everybody's drawn to us. Because we're still defying logic. And that's how God does. No matter what I throw at you, no matter what I do to you, no matter how much I do this, I'm still growing. Why? Because my soil is planted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, this morning, are we burdened down? Here's a boulder. <laughs> a boulder with a tree growing it. There's not a tree around it, yet there's one growing out of this boulder. Of all the places the bird had to land, you had to land on a boulder. And this is the thing. And notice the beautiful purple flowers. It's blooming. When we're burdened down is the greatest time to be unburdened. I can't help but think of Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. How would you like to start a, a book the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord. That phrase, burden of the word, is used on many prophets. Why? They carried the burden of God upon them to proclaim, thus saith the word of the Lord. And notice what he says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not is Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob? They're carrying the burden of preaching God's word to a wicked and degenerate nation. And that burden was heavy. That burden was cumbersome. Yet they did it willingly. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah over just a couple books. Actually, just one. I was thinking of Zephaniah. Act, chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which is stretched forth the heavens, and laying the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit of the man within him. And verse 3, And in the day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All the burden, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. For years, millenniums, people have wanted to get rid of Israel. You know what God says? I'm going to make them burn to some stone. No matter how much you try, you're never going to get rid of it. It's going to cut you to pieces one day. No matter how many times people try to get rid of you, may we be that burdensome stone. May we take the burden of the word of the Lord and make it a blessing and not a cursing. The Lord allows us to be burdened with many things. Some burdens we bring upon ourselves, but sometimes the word, as the word says, the word of the Lord burdens us. God puts us in places where it burdens us to see the people around us, burdens us to see our nation the way it is, burdens us to see our churches the way they are. But you know what? That burden is not to be carried heavily, but lightly. You know why the Bible says? 
Cast my, your cares upon him for he careth for you. Let him carry the majority of that burden. His yoke is easy, it says. I've picked up a few yokes in my, uh, my uncle's barns for their big old oxen. Those are not light. They're massive. But have you ever seen an ox's neck? They're massive. They'll sling you from kingdom come really quickly just by wrong. <laughs> Trust me, we've raised a few cows. And you don't realize how strong their necks are until they decide to play but you. <laughs> I'm not playing with a 1,200 pound bull, sorry. But he wants to play. But he would just boom. And it was like, whoa, wow. But think about this. To them, it has, they don't feel it. Just their necks don't go down. They just carry it. But for us, it's like, man, it's heavy. You know what the Bible says? Take my yoke upon you. But how is it easy, Lord? We got to let go and let God. God has us growing. And you know what? That defies logic. Even though we're burning down, we're still blessed. We're still, you don't see Malachi, you don't see Zechariah complaining. You didn't see Jeremiah who was burdened with the Lord. He was a weeping prophet because he cared about his nation. He cared about the condition of his nation. It didn't mean that he quit on the Lord. Didn't mean that he let the burdens weigh him down. He continued doing what he's doing until he passed away. Same with Malachi. Same with Zechariah. Same with Haggai, the burden of the word of the Lord. All these prophets had to deliver a message that was hard. It was toiling upon them. But they did it because the Bible says of Haggai, he was a messenger of the Lord. Sometimes we have to deliver tough messages in the way we walk, the way we talk, and the way we live. Being a Christian is not a burden, it's a blessing. Amen. Being lost and undone on your way to hell is a burden. But we're a blessing. And the world doesn't like it. The devil doesn't like it. But let's not be burdened down with the calling of the Lord upon our lives. But let's be blessed and honored that he called us to live when we've been walled out. When we've been locked up. When we've been isolated. When we've been burdened down. It's where God has us. Because God always brings the victory. All these are massive obstacles I showed you this morning. But each one, that one tree defied all logic and grew. And this morning I want to challenge you to defy all logic of worldly thinking. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the unbelievers. But to us, it is far from foolishness. It is the foundation of our faith. It is the foundation of our gumption, of our willpower. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me, including growing over the wall, growing in the lock, growing on the top of the highest mountain, and growing through a boulder. Instead of it weighing down and squashing this tree, one day it'll split the rock. You can already see the crack forming. It defied logic. I have had to beat through some rocks with jackhammers, and I wish it never did. That's why I'm kind of brain dead right now, because you know all my brain cells got rattled out. But you know, sometimes those rocks, I about give up. I'm not a very big fellow, but when you get a 200-pound jackhammer and that thing goes like crazy, it's like you look like Bugs Bunny. <laughs> But I still couldn't bust through the rock. We had to bring in the excavators to break through the rocks. And when that didn't work, we had to bring in the dynamite. And yet a tree is cracking that boulder. Defies. Nature defies. This new nature defies the world's logic. God has you here for a reason. So that when we're walled out, God makes us look up. When we're locked up, we're locked in. When we're isolated, we're not alone. For where I am, I will be with you always. And when we're burdened down, we're actually not burdened down at all. We're blessed to carry the burden for the people around us. May God use us 
to grow in any environment He places us. And may, in whatever state we in, learn to be with content. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your message that you've laid upon the hearts. Thank you for the message you laid upon my heart to be able to preach it and to remind myself of all the circumstances and the environment you've allowed us to be in. Through the storms, through the valleys, through the mountain peaks, through the sunshine, there's been a growing through all of it. Use this, I pray, to challenge our hearts to remember these trees, four simple trees, and what you can do with us through these trees. God, we ask you that you continue to lead, guide, and direct in all you've done. And Lord, may we never look around, but look up and look to the eyes of Jesus. And when we feel ourselves sinking in miry clay, may we reach up to hold the Savior's hand. Lord, thank you for that promise that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And we're looking forward to a great time. Let's not forget tonight there'll be no service. And um, let's continue to remember all of our members that are not able to be here and that have been affected by the storm. And just pray that God would just help our crews safely through the day and through the night and give them the speed and the safety they need to be able to restore our community back to the way it was. Lord bless. Have a great day.